I'm Chris Carter. This is the Locked On Steelers podcast. And today we'll talk about the, the anonymous ESPN poll of NFL executives about whether or not Patrick Queen really is a top four linebacker. Joining me that is Nick Farabaugh of PennLive.com. We'll talk about that and take more of your questions here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things in the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the show on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making us your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the number one sportsbook in America. Make every moment more. Right now, this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus every single day. That's right. There's something for everyone all, every day, all day, summer long, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. As I said, we're joined by Nick Farabaugh from PenLive.com, their Steelers beat reporter, who is starting up his podcast again very soon here. Uh, so if you want to get more daily, Nick, you know where to go there. Nick, it's great to have you here, but I wanted to talk to you about – you know, the ESPN executives poll that happens every year right around this time before training camp where ESPN talks anonymously to people that work across the NFL about the best players in each position. Jeremy Fowler always does this. And Patrick Queen was listed as the fourth best, you know, off ball linebacker in the NFL here. And that puts him in some really good company, in my opinion, because the, the only guys above him are Matt Milano for the Bills, Roquan Smith, who was his former teammate at the Ravens, and then, of course, Fred Warner for the Niners. But he's ahead of guys like Nick Bolton, uh, Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa, Tremaine Edmonds, Demario Davis, Dre Greenlaw, and uh, Fo- Foyasade o- Olukin from the, from, the, uh, uh, from the Jaguars. That's a lot of names there. And I feel like that's a lot of respect to Patrick Queen, but there's some criticisms in the article about his lack of instincts and that that's going, it's going to show more prominently without Roquan Smith next to him. What's your opinion of of Patrick Queen as he is right now as the leader of the linebacker of a linebacker group? I think he can do it. Uh, You know, I I think you have to understand how young he was when, you know, he Mm. got drafted by the Ravens. This is because a guy came out of school was 20 years old. And so when Roquan came in, yeah, he was a third-year guy, but he was 22. I mean, if you look at any player that's now in the NFL, that's 22, 23, whatever, man, mm-hmm. that's not a finished product. It, it, right. you, you get better over those years. So if you come in at a younger age, you're naturally just going to get better the more closer you get to that you know, fourth, fifth year. Um, so, so Patrick Queen, man, I, I think that's natural kind of elevation of his game that we saw. Now, obviously, playing next to Roquan, it helps when you play next to maybe the best linebacker in football. It's either him or Warren. It does. Um, 100%. So it sure it sure does help. But what also can happen is when you put a guy in an environment like that where he is next to Roquan Smith, that can allow him to develop. He gets to watch a pro do it every day. He mm-hmm. gets to watch a guy do that. He gets to learn tips and tricks from one of the best in the game. And then you see where Patrick Queen was on his film last year. It was another level from what we had seen. Uh, he had his best season of his career last year. He looked – Better. I, I do think, you know, there are, are some concerns about his eyes and his instincts, though. I, I think that is probably his he, – he'll tell you that probably, that he still uh, has some ways to go, you know, with his eyes and processing every now and then. Um, that was his biggest concern coming out of LSU, but he's gotten a lot better at it since coming out of LSU, and that's been a big part of why he's taking that leap. He's a very good coverage linebacker now. He has the athleticism uh, to drop in space, carry guys up on a pole runner if you're kind of in that Tampa 2 scheme. He can do a lot of different things in coverage. So, uh, you know, he's he's really kind of, I think, taking that step from, you know, sidekick of, of Roquan Smith to what I think can be the main guy in a linebacker room. I, I don't really buy into the fact that, you know, he was made by Roquan Smith. I, I'm sure it, it helps him. But also when you're a young guy like that, when you were 22 and you learned from one of the best in the game like Roquan Smith, man, that helps you actually elevate your game. And, and Patrick Queen's still just 24, maybe 25. So um, the Steelers got a young player that is ascending and probably hasn't even played his best football yet. Yeah, he'll turn 25 during training camp in, in uh, mid-August. So, like, that's a great age for a guy to come in with all this experience, right? That's what I see is that we've seen Patrick Queen be a good linebacker. And, and, and like you said, he's had to grow, but 
in three out of his four seasons in the NFL, he's out over 100 tackles. Last year, he, he for the last in each of his four seasons, by the way, he's had at least nine to tackle tackles for loss. He's been he's been a guy who's been a problem. He's been a guy who's who's been uh, who's who's frustrated um, off offenses and a guy that has been a key focus for Steelers matchups. You know, when the Steelers have prepared, they've had to kind of pro, you know what Roquan Smith is a priority, but so is Patrick Queen. And my thing is this, Nick. You put him in the Steelers' defense. Again, you're not asking him to be Roquan. Roquan Smith, I'd say, is arguably the best defensive player on the Ravens' roster right now. He kind of carries that, that that unit as not just the quarterback, but that best player. No one's asking Roquan Smith to be to be to outshine T.J. Watt or Minka Fitzpatrick. They're asking him to be the quarterback of the defense, to run the middle of the field, to make plays when they come to him, and fit into a system. And to me – that is a way to help a player also be better because they're not having to make a thousand reads and, and step way outside of their role. Like when TJ Watt lines up as a pass rusher, but then drops back in coverage and gets an interception and Sean McVay is like, how, where did that come from? What, how did he do that? You're not asking Roquan Smith to, or it's not Roquan Smith, it's to be Patrick Queen to step far out of his, his role here. You're saying, Hey, play to this system, use the athletic talents and use the instincts that you have built up. And then we'll see how far that goes. And I think with the things that Patrick Queen has shown so far, that can go pretty far in a Steelers defense that's lacked a true number one top tier linebacker since the days of Ryan Shazier. Yeah, and I just think it's the coverage ability that you really right. went back to. But I also think, you know, it's it's his blitzing ability. I think, you know, when you play with the Ravens when you play in a Mike McDonald scheme, you're naturally going to be a really good blitzing linebacker. I mean, that, that really is something that you just hone – when you play in a scheme like that where you're doing double A gap mugs, you're doing all these twists and stunts, you're doing, you know, you're showing blitz and then backing up 10, 15 yards to go into a deep zone and deep hook. Um, that's stuff that he did, and you could see it uh, on his tape. He has athleticism to do a lot of really cool things schematically that the Steelers can do. He's a great blitzer. The Steelers really have three great blitzing inside linebackers between mm -hmm. Queen, E-Rob, and, uh, and, and Peyton Wilson. Uh, all three of those guys are great blitzing linebackers. Um, and so Patrick Queen, you know, can blitz extremely well. He can, you come behind Cam Hayward. You can come behind Keanu Benton. Uh, you can do double A gap looks. You can do a lot of different things with Patrick Queen. And you can ask him to cover a lot of ground and coverage. He's a really good zone coverage guy. Uh, he just has really good instincts. Uh, he has good eyes and coverage. Uh, so I really look at Patrick Queen, man, and he's grown as a player year over year. So as you said, he's not going to be asked to be Roquan Smith. You know, Roquan Smith and Fred Warner, those two guys, I think are the clear one-two in this league right now at the off-ball linebacker position. Those guys have otherworldly kind of abilities uh, that they, they they bring to the table. But you look at Patrick Queen, if you ask him to do a bunch of different things, but within the scheme structure, he's going to do that at a high level. Basically, he's going to do what Cole Holcomb and Quan Alexander and Elena Roberts were asked to do, but he can do it with that added athleticism, that added layer of kind of uh, game-breaking ability due to that athleticism. Agreed. I, and I think that does a lot for the Steelers' defense. I want to talk more about what specifically it can do and what it could mean for the Steelers' defense in 2024. We'll get to that next and take some of your questions here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter, Nick Faraba, stick with us. We'll be right back. But first, I want to remind you, this show is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for small businesses, you want to find quality professionals that are right for that role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps your hire prior professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even though even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows the small businesses are wearing so many hats and might, might not have the time or resources to hire. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We're back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter here with Nick Faribault of penlive.com. Nick, let's get. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit more about this linebacker situation before we dip into some of these questions. 
if let's say Patrick Queen is the things that, that that you and I think he can be, like they like he's he shows his growth, the athleticism, he puts it all together, and he is that upper tier linebacker. And again, not the best linebacker, you know, he's not Fred Warner and and, and Roquan Smith and those guys. But if he's like the the immediate step under them, what does that do for a Steelers defense as far as the the how it how it you know comprises itself and the the either the weaknesses that it erases or the strengths that it gives it? Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about it. I, I think you know last year I thought a big weakness of their ability to get pressure was the was the fact that they didn't have a lot of schematic versatility to actually get pressure. I thought mm-hmm. they won a lot with four or five or, or guys yeah. like that, just, just through talent winning. Uh, but I actually think, you know, a guy like Patrick Queen is going to be able to bring different looks that they can do from that second level to really get pressure. I, I think that's going to be a big thing. I think when you have speed and athleticism that covers ground in the middle, it really pauses quarterbacks in those short little windows in the middle of the field. I, I think – you know, that's one thing. I also just think this isn't just a Patrick Queen thing. It's, you know, Dante Jackson, Deshaun Elliott adding this kind of speed to this defense. Last year, how many guys did we see catch just a short drag route and then take it 30 yards after the catch where that was yep. broken tackles? Um, just speed not to get into pursuit angles. I think that's one thing. When you have a fast linebacking core like this, that helps. But I think Patrick Queen – you know, the sideline to sideline speed. I think a lot of the times when they got hit on the ground game, it was to the perimeter last year. I thought that mm-hmm. was where a lot of teams hit them hard was sideline to sideline. Um, now, not all of that was on linebackers. I think some of that was on corner play. I think safety play, some of the injuries that hit the linebacker room eventually uh, really ricocheted into that. Uh, but where you really saw that was they didn't have a guy that was just an unbelievable athlete at linebacker that could go sideline to sideline and make those great plays ranging over the top. I think he can do that. Um, and, and then you look in coverage, you know, I, I think you can take what Quan Alexander and Landon Roberts and Cole Holcomb did in those zone coverages, and you can see him replicate that. But I also think he gives you some upside if you want to put him in and say you put him in a man situation where you put him maybe against a running back or a tight end. He could probably carry those guys underneath. So it opens up a lot more pressure calls. It opens up a lot more schematic versatility for a guy like Minka Fitzpatrick to do a lot of cool things over the middle of the field and and play with disguises where you want to put him. You know, we, we've talked about Sean Elliott a lot with the Minka ball element, but Patrick Queen also aids in that because he allows you – these disguises what the Steelers did on defense last year, largely due to injury or personnel issues, just because they didn't have a fast secondary was they played it very vanilla. There wasn't a lot of picture changing from pre-snap to post-snap. There wasn't a lot of blitzes that left them exposed in man coverage. What this is going to allow them to do though, is it's going to allow them to give them different looks in the fronts, you know, with blitzes, it's going to allow them to disguise pre-snap post-snap. You're going to have different options because of speed and Patrick Queen's going to aid in that. I agree. And I, again, this is why I talked about this with Jim Wetzel on yesterday's uh, or two days ago, excuse me, when I said he, I asked him how far back you, you might, you have to go to find a Steelers defensive roster that you like as much as this one. And he brought up 2010. And so I think that's the thing is that when you look at all the components here and I, yes, there's still things that need to happen. The defensive line needs to show that, that Keanu Benton's taking a step forward. Cam Hayward's back ready and healthy. DeMarvin Leal's better than what he was last year. They need to figure out if Dante Jackson could be a solid number two corner, who's going to play slot. All those are legitimate questions. But when you look at the, the composition from the edge rushing talent, from the backups at edge rushing, from the, the, the safety depth, you know, Joy Porter Jr. is your number one corner, potential of just finding a number two corner with this roster. And then the linebackers as a whole group, I look at this and I think this is a really good unit that has a lot of potential. And I think that if if Patrick Queen becomes an elite linebacker for the Steelers, well, he kind of can be an elite linebacker, but if he is an elite linebacker for the Steelers, that does so much for the potential of his defense. And I think it puts them in a really good situation uh, to move uh, to move forward this year with a really strong defensive season. I want to get to this question though because we go we do want to get some more questions here. We got a lot of piled up over over the months uh, here. So this is a question that comes from Mark of Warren, Ohio, about Russell Wilson when it comes to the him comparing him and Justin Fields. Take it away, Mark. Hey, Chris. This is Mark from out in Warren, Ohio. Hey, uh, my biggest question about the Justin Fields Russell Wilson competition is that most people are pointing to Russell Wilson's leadership. 
But when Russell Wilson won two Super Bowls, he was a young guy, and he won those two Super Bowls using his physical skills, his physical attributes. And it was that defense and other players on the team that were leading the way. So why isn't Justin Fields giving you being given that same opportunity to use his physical skills to benefit the team the way Russell did when he first came into the NFL. Thank thank you, Mark, for your question. As always, you can call in just like Mark did to 412-223-6644. Leave your name, keep your question under a minute, and give it. let us know where you're from, and we're happy to have you on the show. Uh, Nick, let's get into that a little bit here. Russell Wilson, when he came into the NFL – I think part of it is are the teams that they inherited, right? Russell Wilson inherited the Legion of Boom. He inherited, you know, Marshawn Lynch and Pete Carroll and a system of winning that was just be getting established there in Seattle. And so when he came in, you know, his first in his first four seasons, his passer rating was 100, 101.2, 95, and 110.1. That last one being the the, the highest in the NFL in those years. But he was never asked to do too much with it in fact in 2015 of those four years the most that was the most he threw and it was uh 4,024 yards every other time he was under 3,500 yards and I I hear what Mark's saying here right because he's not saying that Russell Wilson's bad it's like hey but he had a a more advantageous situation than Justin Fields did and I think that that's unequivocally correct but I look at this and I still say I think part of the reason is because Russell Wilson had that solid footing he kind of gets that chance to show hey I still got that. I still am that leader that 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 that's been there. I mean, you look at you know you know what he did in Denver last year. Even if he just gives the Steelers twenty six touchdowns and eight interceptions, that's a huge boost. Whereas Justin Fields, I feel like because he was in a rougher situation, he kind of needs to, the Steelers kind of need to clean off the mistakes that the, the mistakes he made, the bad habits he might have developed, and say, hey, learn what we need you to learn, and then maybe you're going to be ready after that. But do you think Mark's onto something here? It's, it's interesting because that when they came into the NFL, both were vastly different levels. Uh, first of yes. all, Russell Wilson was a mid-round pick and yeah, won the heard. competition. Um, remember, they signed Matt Flynn to a big contract, mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. beat him out. Um, so just completely different in terms of that. Justin Fields came in, and he immediately was, okay, we're, we're putting you – in the air position to become the face of the franchise. So he wore that crown. They traded up for him. They they did all of this stuff for him. So he wore a heavier burden uh, for sure. What is interesting is Russell Wilson had that infrastructure around him of leaders. You talk about Bobby Wagner. You talk about Cam Chancellor. You talk about Richard Sherman. You talk about all those guys you think about on the Legion of Boom defense. Who did who, who did Justin Fields have? you know, to really lean on significantly. It was a young team that was coming up together. So mm-hmm. it's, it's very different. Um, and so, you know, Russell Wilson is coming in here as a former Super Bowl winning quarterback. Now he's being given that because there's only so many Super Bowl winning quarterbacks that have started a decade plus in the NFL. So there's a pedigree that I think Mike Tomlin respects when you look at Russell Wilson. I think that's a big part of why, you know, the pole position stuff is a thing. I just think – Mike Tomlin respects pedigree, respects accomplishments, respects resumes. And Russell Wilson, if you look at it, has a very, very stark resume. I mean, it's a very impressive resume, even if what happened in Denver obviously did not go well. Justin Fields, man, has all the upside in the world, but he's never been given an opportunity where he doesn't have to bear the weight of the franchise. I think that's something that could maybe benefit Justin Fields is – Justin Fields is now coming from the scrappy underdog position. He's the guy that's listed as the backup. He's the guy that, you know, has to win the job. And even if he doesn't win the job, he gets to learn from Russell Wilson. So it takes pressure off Justin Fields where he hasn't had that pressure off him. So, like, I get, you know, what Mark's saying here. I think it's it's vastly different backgrounds, and Russell Wilson's kind of getting the, the head start because of the resume and, and kind of what happened. But I also think there's probably an argument to be made here that it helps Justin Fields a little bit just to have, okay, that pressure's not on you completely to, to be the face of the franchise, the burden of the franchise, to be that quarterback uh, that everyone turns to, you know, right away. I think that that's something that Justin Fields can focus on himself and say, okay, what do I need to improve on? Cut down these turnovers, cut down on this, 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 this. There's a lot of pressure on Russell Wilson right now. 
and he's he's worn that before. So I think that's a big differentiating factor when we look at these guys. I think so too. I think that that's part of the, part of this is is where they've come from, who they are, and right now the Steelers need someone who's done it. You know, who who's been who's led in an offense and knows what it's like. And I think that's where. Justin Fields is still learning how to do that. You know, he's, he, you know, R- Russell Wilson has won a Super Bowl. And yes, he was, uh, he was less, less of the leader of the train. You know, he was less of the conductor than more than he more was a passenger, uh, but he was a, a contributing passenger and he's been a leader on other very good teams. So I, I think that that's, that that's a big part of that plays into that. And again, I, I don't think it's really a competition right now. I think Russell, it's Russell Wilson's job, but I do think, and I talked about this on my Monday episode, that this is a great chance for Justin Fields to work on his mechanics, sharpen things, become a better reader, work with Tom Arth, the Steelers quarterback, switch very closely. And if he does that, and you know, if Russell Wilson gets hurt, hurt this year and he shows that he's ready, that could rejuvenate his career. People will see, oh, wait, he still got it, or he's found something else that we weren't sure if he still had. And then all of a sudden, maybe the Steelers are talking about not resigning him to a longer deal after the season. Maybe he hits free agency, he makes a lot of money. Either way, it would benefit it would benefit him and benefit the Steelers for him to just take this time to focus, become better, and then when he gets a shot, show what he has. Yeah, I think that's that's a big part of this. And again, the burden of not having a franchise on your back for for a guy like Justin Fields, it, it, it does help a little bit. Now, does he have pressure because he's in a contract year? Yeah. Does Russell Wilson also have that same pressure though? Because he's in a contract year too. Yeah. Um, so they all have different types of pressures on them. Um, but this is going to be a good spot, even if Justin Fields say, I, I don't think, you know, it's completely a done deal that Russell Wilson will start. But I do think he's definitely I think like 2022, where I think, you know, they said it was a three way quarterback. but It was pretty clear from the start. You and I were there, Chris, that they thought Mitch Trubisky was the best quarterback that they had. He was probably going to start the year unless he was just horrific or and someone rose up with him. Um, so I think, you know, it there'd have to be a combination of Russell Wilson just just stinking out loud during the preseason training yeah. camp, Justin Fields soaring up, you know, the super levels. I think that would be what it needs. Um, but I do think this is a great spot for Justin Fields, man. He's got really, I mean, he really doesn't have much to lose. And so he can just sit back, take in what Russell Wilson's going to give him, take in what the coaches are doing, show that he's the best, you know, worker he can be. He can improve his game. And then when he gets a shot, as you said, in game, that's the time when it's showtime, right? Absolutely. I want to get to another question here in a second. We'll do that here next after this break here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter, Nick Farabaugh, stick with us. We'll be right back. But first, I want to remind you, this show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the number one sports in, sportsbook in America. I love sports, and I love them so much that I never want them to stop. And even though the NBA and the NHL finished up this summer and there's fewer games, that doesn't mean that there's any less action because there's still plenty of other games out there. FanDuel can have you locked on all that action all summer long as you get your best plays in Major League Baseball, the WNBA, big fights, and so much more. All you have to do is open the app from FanDuel and dream up in any bets that you're, that you're in the mood for, as well as go to their website, FanDuel.com. This summer, FanDuel's hooking up all all customers with a boost or a bonus every single day. That's right. Everyone, not just new customers, not just returning customers. If you go to FanDuel, no matter what your history has been with it, you're going to see a daily bonus available to get you ahead in your betting. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on today and start making the most out of your summer. And that's FanDuel, official sportsbook betting, betting partner of Major League Baseball. We're back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Nick Farabaugh. Nick, we're going to take one more question here, and this is the time of year where we kind of branch out with some of our questions. We don't focus as much on all the X's and O's that could be and everything like that. We take some questions that think outside of the box, and sometimes you get one of these. And this guy asked a similar question last year, so I'm going to let him ask it again. Parker from Indianapolis, take it away. Hey, Chris, this is Parker from Indianapolis. I asked you this question last year, and uh, with the roster updates from this year, I'd be curious to what your answer be changing. What is one player that you would like to add from anywhere in the NFL to the offense and defense. Mine would be uh, Amon Ron St. Brown on the offense for more of a quick hand uh, receiver, and on the defense would be Kenny Moore from the Colts and the Nickelback, because I feel like that's our weakest spot on the defense. Love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. 
Thank you, Parker. And as always, you can call into the show just like Parker and Mark did for this show at 412-223-6644. Leave your name uh, where you're from. Keep your question under a minute. But Nick, I I think when we're talking offense, there is one name that should always be mentioned first before Amon Ross St. Brown, before Tyreek Hill, before anybody that ain't Jesus Christ. It's Patrick Mahomes. And if you're not naming him, you're crazy because you add Patrick Mahomes to the Steelers offense and their Super Bowl favorites immediately. Right. Right. It, I mean, Patrick Mahomes would be the pick every time. And even if you even put down someone else, right, it would then go probably to the second tier of quarterbacks. Yep. Would take uh, another guy. So the quarterback position would obviously be the one that you would pick. But mm-hmm. let's say we're not picking quarterbacks. Let's, let's go that, non-QBs. I, I think that's let's fair. say non-quarterback because Mahomes is the obvious correct answer. I mean, I, I, I go to Justin Jefferson immediately. I think he's the best receiver in the NFL. I, I um, agree entirely. And, I mean, he's the most complete player. You put Jefferson across from George Pickens and teams, good luck. I mean, really, it, it is that. Uh, so I think Justin Jefferson would be the easy pick. That's a true number one receiver. Maybe if George Pickens you know, might be – of one himself. I mean, if that that at that bet at your best man, that's the best receiving duo in the NFL. Honestly. I mean, I, I, I'm right with you. You you throw Justin Jefferson on this team, my goodness, and, and that's saying a lot because Jordan Addison was pretty good last year for for the Vikings as well. So like you know, but at the same time, yet yeah, Jettas is, is is to me is the best receiving option. Um, I think you could throw in other guys in the conversation. I think if you threw Jamar Chase in, I wouldn't be mad at you. I think if you threw through CD Lamb in it, I wouldn't be mad at you. And there's yeah. and that. The C.D. Lamb thing is a little interesting to me because there are some questions as far as what who is Dallas going to pay to stick around, you know, and, and be and be a cowboy, and they better pay C.D. Lamb. But if he doesn't, C.D. Lamb stands a, a stands a chance to make a ridiculous contract on the open market in the NFL. Uh, one which, you know, if certain things line up to certain ways, I'd be like, if I'm the Steelers, I might be like, hmm, what's going on there? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's even an argument if you really wanted – if you said you didn't want to go receiver, you could probably make a legitimate argument for Trent Williams or Tristan Wirfs. Um, mm. When you have, you know, two young tackles, you figure yeah. there's going to be young tackles. But if someone so- said to the Steelers, you can have Tristan Wirfs, I mean, they're going to take Tristan Wirfs. Right. Um, so I think he he has – he's like a sleeper candidate, I would put. But I think Justin Jefferson would be the guy I would pick if we're obviously not picking Mahomes. Right. And, and I think also the Steelers might have some faith that like, hey, Broderick Jones and Troy Faltano could turn out pretty strong there. Um, like, you know, if I'm debating which position that I'd go for the best player in the NFL on, I, I think I, with this just the situation of their roster, I'd absolutely go wide receiver. And that would make a lot of sense. So let's let's flip over to defense. It's funny because when I asked you this off camera before we started, just to make sure I, I we have the exact same answers as yep. far as what positions should be targeted. And who would be targeted? Now I hear I hear going after a nickel corner, but I'm sorry. If if nickel corner is still a question, and I'm able to figure get the best outside cornerback in the NFL right now, I will take that over getting a really good nickel corner and then still not being not sure about Dante Jackson next to next to Joey Porter Jr. And with th- with that, Nick, you and I agree. If <laughs> if if they're getting a corner, we'll get to the other position that we talked about in the second year. If they're getting a corner. You go get Patrick Sertan. Yep. Sertan and Porter would be that. That's something the Steelers ain't seen. The uh, like the potential that would be there. That, that would be first of all. That's the best corner duo in the NFL. Second of all, uh, the the ability to play press with that duo is oh. special. Um, would would be just an all time versatile type of of press duo that you can do so many different things with you can man up on the outside and really be comfortable with it like there's so many things you could do with Sertan I mean the only other corner I would consider is is Sauce I think Sauce Gardner is probably Mm -hmm. you know the the youth the the high level that he has but I think Sertan's the best corner in the NFL right now so I I think you have to take him with the versatility that he would provide too because Sertan's not just a a guy you know that that can play up, he can play off, and, and do a lot of different things. So they they can do so many different things with him. It, it, and, and listen, I get the Nickelback questions. I understand, but you can get Sertan and, and Porter. I don't think it's a question at that point. You take that. 
Absolutely. The other question, the other t- position we talked about was defensive tackle, because, again, you look at linebacker, you're solid there. You know, you look at edge rusher, you're solid there. You look at safety, you're you're you're, you're set. Defensive tackle is the one spot where it's like if Cam Hayward you know, resurrects himself to be back where he was two years ago. Great. Awesome. Then him and Keanu Benton could be a wrecking du- duo. And then you have uh, Larry Okunjobi, you have Marvin Leal, you have depth there. That's awesome. And then even guys like Lowry, they've added like there's there's potential there. Right. Like but if you could get a for sure fire top tier interior pass rusher before this year we would have said Aaron Donald but with the with the people left in the NFL I, I think you'd be silly to go get anyone else other than Chris Jones 100 percent he's the best best pass rushing defensive tackle in the NFL best defensive tackle in the NFL there's a lot of really good defensive tackles out there but there I, I still think he's the best um you know you could throw names around you know Dexter Lawrence had an unreal year mm-hmm. last year Mm-hmm. Um, there's just so there's so many names that you can rattle off at defensive tackle nowadays in the NFL, but I, I still would take Chris Jones. Uh, he is unbelievable. You add him with TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith. I, I mean, I'm serious. I don't know how you block that. Um, yeah, it, it would be incredible. So I think he's the obvious choice if you're going defensive tackle. I am interested to see which one you would actually pick, though. Would would you pick Jones or Sertan? Because I I'm think we agree both. But these are the top two that you would pick. Yeah. Would you prefer the top corner, or the top defensive tackle? I think I'm taking the top corner. I think in today's NFL, if if you give me the opportunity to completely wipe out a, a, a team's top two receivers in today's NFL for the teams that they're about to face, if they want to, if they want to make a run this year, if they, if the, if you want to take on the 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 Bengals and. Jamar Chase and T Higgins. If you want to take on, you know, the Texans, the Chiefs, you need you need to be able to make it make it really tough on these quarterbacks. Today. And here's the other thing: if you have two shutdown corners, remember all that aggressiveness we were talking about the Steelers' defense could use this year. It opens that up so much more when you can say, "Hey, do all that." Like Minka Fitzpatrick, be wherever you want to be. Deshaun Elliott, you know, do this. Patrick Queen, do that. You know, edge rushers, everyone blitz in different ways. But guess what? You don't got to worry about those top two guys on the outside and where they are because those two corners are going to erase them. I think strategically that would do a lot more for me. And, and I guess part of the fun of that asking these types of questions, it allows us to refocus away from the Steelers for a second and say, hey, these are still the prior- priority positions in the NFL and these are the players of those priority positions. It's kind of interesting because I think it's easier to find impact defensive tackles nowadays. There's just more of them. I agree. Um, but on the other hand, I also think corner is a volatile position. And top guys sometimes fall off very quickly. So I, I, if we're assuming we're just taking them for, say, a year, I think I have to take top corner personally. We're going long term stability. I think I, you know, I would take the top defensive tackle in this case, Chris hmm. Jones. I know he's older, but you know, all things considered, but, uh, um, right? Right. So, um, but I think you know, if you're telling me this year of who they can have for one year, I take Sertan. I would just because guys like Sertan, man, they don't come around very often. A, a true top elite corner is is not common. Like most teams don't have that guy. Most teams don't have elite corners that can match guys like this. Uh, there's a, a more corner talent coming into the NFL now. They're they're starting. We're starting to see that kind of because you saw the wide receiver talent explode around the mid to late 2010s, mm-hmm. and a lot of college programs have started to shift some of those athletes that would have played, you know, running back or wide receiver, and they're shifting them to corner now. So you're starting to see the corner talent get up a little bit, but you still don't see Sertans everywhere. They're rare. So I, I think I agree with you. For one year one, I would take Sertan. I, I feel I feel you on that. There's a lot of things that we would that we would discuss here on that, but it's always fun to kind of take a step back and look at things like that. Thank you to our our, our guys who asked questions, uh, both Mark and Parker, uh, who called in again four one two 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 three six six four four. Thank you again, Nick, for joining us here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Let me can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. Yeah, you could follow me on X Twitter at Faraba FB. Make sure to check out the stuff um, Pen Live. Follow at Steelers on Pen Live on Twitter. And make sure to follow uh, our YouTube channel, uh, Pen Lo- Steelers on Pen Live. We got uh, the the podcast dropping. Got plenty of stuff going over there. Chris, hopefully you're on there a few times every now and then. 
Oh yeah, anytime you call me, Nick, I'll I'll, I'll be around. Just 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 not this weekend because I need I know your boy <laughs> needs a vacation. Uh, but thanks again, Nick, for joining us here. Thank you all for joining us here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. Read my work at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Find me here every day, Monday through Friday, breaking down your Pittsburgh Steelers right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Back tomorrow, finishing out the week before training camp when everything starts to get real. We'll see you then here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. <laughs> 